Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'm Dave Asprey, and you may have noticed there's something on my forehead. Those are electrodes, and just sort of for the sake of being interesting, as well as for mental performance, I'm running a shaped square wave 50 hertz current across my brain right now that comes out of a 9-volt battery. It's a technique called cerebral electrostimulation. I've been doing this in a whole bunch of other electronic and nutritional vitamin and pharmaceutical interventions for brain and physical health for, oh, last 15 years or so. Uh, I have an EEG at home. I have a new one on the way I'm really excited about. And so I'm definitely a, a biohacker. And uh, what being in a gamma state does, which corresponds with 50 hertz, is actually makes you a little bit more focused and vibrant and just more present, which is kind of nice. I've never actually presented. I've monitored myself while presenting, but I haven't actually actively hacked myself while I'm presenting. So this is the first time for me. If I fall over, just turn the volume down. I'll be fine. My Twitter and my blog and all where I talk about a lot of this stuff is available up here. So I wanted to talk about the path of being hyper-connected, which I probably am, although I'm not sure that's a good thing to say. This is a, a Capro 2, a 40-pound, maybe the first portable personal computer you could have from 1981. Now I'm old, uh, I guess. Before Windows, before DOS, I had this because I was eight and uh, my father was an IT guy. So I started, learned how to type, and spent a lot of time on that computer with a nine-inch green screen. So it, it, doing this presentation made me think, I'm actually one of the first people to live a substantial percentage of his life online, because people who were born even five years after me, it was much more prevalent, and people born five years before me, they didn't have computers. And I was an early adopter, you could say. I've also been hyper-connected for a while. My first internet date was actually 20 years ago. This was actually before they had a web browser. So I worked in the computer labs, and I, I wanted to meet this girl, so I, I broke her computer. Uh, you know, I did it in a humorous way. And I was trying to find the right graphic, and I got it. So, but basically, the, uh, by the way, this is a trend micro graphic. If you want to know what a hacker looks like, they look like anyone in this room. There is no way to graphically represent a computer criminal who might hack your personal data, so they wear ski masks and type with one hand. I also was the first person, that's actually my photo when I was 20-something, when I weighed about 300 pounds, first person to sell anything online. I paid for my computer science education selling caffeine t-shirts that said, caffeine, my drug of choice, with a picture of the molecule right here. That was really cool, okay? I'm basically really young, and I'm in all these magazines, and I had my sort of 15 minutes of fame. That was a really good thing about being very public. The way this happened is because I lived my life online. I flamed a Rutgers professor of marketing who said no one would ever make money off the internet, and I said, that's funny, I'm doing it now. Well, there was a con. I think, and I have to apologize for this, I think I may have contributed to the creation of spam. It would have happened anyway, but two weeks after the article about how to market on Usenet came out, the world's first spam from an, a law company called Cantor and Siegel trying to sell illegal green cards um, hit Usenet. I don't know if they read the article, but I think they did. Problem was, maybe spent a little too much time online because I would hit 300 pounds. That's a lot, 150 kilos. Then, I sort of thought there should be a way to use the browser to communicate with friends, and being the hacker type, created this website from, I don't know what year this is now, whatever 18 years ago from today is. That's my pet iguana, Skippy, um, who's now no longer with us. And there's an interesting thing here. I just caught this as part of this presentation. Dave is never really out of touch because of things that, uh, I didn't add that, that was actually from 18 years ago. But here's what it does to you. There was a point in my life when I realized I could know every website that, that was started on the internet because there were so few of them. So I was like, yeah, I know about all this stuff. Like, the internet is mine, all mine. <laughs> the problem was, I, maybe I'll just sleep a little bit less. I, I have a whole blog now about how to sleep less and stay healthy, about sleep hacking. But I, I wasn't doing it the right way back then, and it affected my health. And when my email account would go down, um, it was like, Literally, I felt like it was the end of the world. It was super stressful. Um, I literally would just like be beside myself, which is ridiculous. I would say that I was actually classically an internet addict, even though we don't talk about that anymore because that was like the media story from six or seven years ago. But I think it actually happens where you just compulsively click on stuff. And it certainly was something that I did without really thinking about it. 
And then my brain started to break. Maybe it's because I was fat. I don't know. But I noticed my cognitive performance was going down. But I thought maybe it wasn't me. Like maybe I could just make sure that it's, it's just not my perception of things. So I used my favorite biohacking tool of all time, which is called FreeCell. Uh, do you guys know FreeCell? It's a solitaire game you play on your computer. I found out I could play three games of that every day, and some days I couldn't do it, and some days I could. And the days when I couldn't do it were the days when I felt kind of like my brain wasn't working anymore. It turns out my brain really wasn't working, and I could graph which days that was a problem. So now I was fat, and I'm getting to be stupid, and, and you know, in seventh grade, that's not what you want. So, ooh, that was a fast jump. So I decided I needed to, uh, to hack myself a little bit here. And then I got to this uh, internet company. At 26, I made $6 million in about a year and a half. It was a really nice time. At the first company to invent web hosting. So Google, Hotmail, Yahoo, all of their first servers when they were founded were stored in the buildings and served by the bandwidth from the company um, that I joined. I was featured in Monster Careers because I was an early adopter of social networking. And the company went bankrupt. It's like a problem. If you think you're set when you're 28 and that you're gonna spend the rest of your life basically like getting degrees and things you don't know anything about, uh, and then you don't and you're not set anymore, that'll create even more stress. Uh, and that happened to me. And I started saying, I think I should live forever anyway. So I started doing a lot of work on anti-aging and to this day I run an anti-aging nonprofit that's about 18 years old. Uh, this is something I posted in about 98, um, sort of saying, here's a framework for understanding the, the levers and knobs you can use. So I say I'm hyper-connected. Yeah, uh, I think I, may, I meet that requirement. And I hadn't thought of myself in that way, so maybe I'm embarrassed now. But if I'm going to hack myself, I need to measure myself. So this is written by a physician, which means none of you can read it. That says increased risk for stroke MI. Stroke, that's basically a heart attack, myocardial infarction. So now I'm 30, and they're like, yeah, you're fat, you're stupid, and you're going to die. And I said, well, all right, maybe we'll see what's going on with the stress. So I got another stress panel here. This is a saliva test, and it's also hard to read, so we'll zoom in there. These are scans of the actual documents. So if your score is greater than 12, this is your ratio of norepinephrine to epinephrine. These are key neurotransmitters. If it goes less than 12, you're stressed, you're tired, you have low energy and lo no motivation, you're burned out, and you don't concentrate well. Your brain is breaking. So I said, well, what's my score going to be? Oops. And I said, all right, let's see, this is actually my brain. So I said, all right, let's go blow $4,000 and get a spec scan. This type of scan is popular with Dr. Amen, who's written a really good series of books called uh, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, and a bunch of other things like that. Dr. Amen says you can look at what's happening in a specific part of the brain and s look at how that affects your behavior. I would say he's right, and people are coming around to that, but when he first started writing this 10 and 15 years ago, he was hated by psychiatry in general. So this was one of the three pages of, of findings, and I have like 30 or 40 pages of pictures. But they're basically telling me you have not enough blood flow in your prefrontal cortex where your logic stuff happens, and basically... Interesting referral? I'm 30 and I'm an interesting referral. That's just not even right. Yeah, that's doctor speak for um, guinea pig time. So from there, I did some work, did some hacking, and, and actually improved my health substantially, but not all the way. I said, all right, I'm going to go to Southeast Asia and I'm going to spend a couple months uh, walking around and just having some fun. But I don't want to be disconnected here, not at all. So I'm going to, to bring a laptop. This was back in 04 or something. So I bought a three pound little Acer tablet thing, on one of the previous kind of tablets that opened up and clamshelled and spun around. And I thought I'll just lug the thing around. And that way I can, when I'm, there's no bandwidth there, so I'll be able to go to my with, download my email, and then do my email at night, and it'll be great. And it has a battery, so I don't need power. So I was actually educated by two things. Very slow bandwidth in Asia in 2004, and something that I contributed to, spam. The first time I plugged in uh, somewhere in, I think that was in Bangkok, I said, all right, I need to download. So I was borrowing bandwidth. And it turned out the volume of spam that I was receiving, because my email had, account had been open for so long, um, like more than 10 years at the time, uh, the volume of spam just was actually more than the bandwidth could handle. So even if I left my computer on all the time, I could never download my email because there was too much spam. 
for the size of the pipe. And I'm like, oh, this is awful. Now I have to lug this laptop around and I can't even use it. But it, it maybe was a blessing in disguise. Because I realized, you know, wow, when you're not connected, different things happen. So I decided if I wanted to stay sane and, and happy, really, I could reduce the internet consumption that I, I had, which had a really bad downside. I, I'm an entrepreneur in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, I've had all sorts of, of very fortunate and career success, and it's predicated on being online. So I could basically become a yoga teacher, or I could actually change the way I work so that I can do the things I want to do. And that's what I decided to do. I hacked my brain, decided just to up, upgrade it, and I decided I needed to change my nervous system response to information overload, and I did that as well. By the way, that's Mount Kailash in the back there, which is kind of like in remote western Tibet. That's a cool place. This is uh, me playing around with a 64-channel EEG headnet, uh, just uh, one of those things that lets you get an extremely detailed picture of what's going on in your brain. This is part of a session I did at a private laboratory that's in the middle of nowhere in Canada, where in seven days you can do the equivalent of 40 years worth of Zen meditation. At the end of seven days, your brain does the same thing that someone who spent their entire life doing a daily practice can do. Pretty profound stuff, actually, and it does rewire your stress response. That's what it looks like. Have you ever seen Dr. Seuss when they have those drawings of those little things? Well, it's kind of like that. You sit down here, they glue with enormous amounts of really sticky, gross paste. They glue electrodes to your head, nowhere near as cool looking as these guys. And then you sit in a room, and all you have to do is whatever it takes to make the sounds go louder. And the sounds go louder when your brain is closer to the meditative state. It turns out that it's very hard to do that, but over time you get frustrated because it's not working, so then you sort of just figure out how to do it, and then they give you some techniques uh, uh, that help as well. So I definitely hack my brain. That's one of the many ways that I've changed how it works. Now, I, I live a hyper-connected life now. I took these screenshots the other day. And 500 and something Facebook friends, 2,600 LinkedIn people, clout scores, about five or 6,000 Twitter followers in the different accounts that I manage. I'm senior executive guy at Trend Micro, travel around the world, talk about cloud computing, uh, and I, I'm actually an expert in it. I keep up to speed on that. So I consume an enormous amount of information about the latest security threats and things like that. Two months ago, I made the cover of the Financial Times for my hobby, not for my day job, which is the coolest thing of all. Um, I was actually wearing the same electrodes up there. Uh, I've been an angel investor. Um, I have two kids, two young kids. Uh, actually, say I'm a published author, that's a lie. A soon-to-be published author. I have a publisher, and I have a manuscript that's completed. Uh, it just isn't published yet. The book is how to change your baby's genes based on what you do during pregnancy. Basically, it's how to upgrade your baby so you have less risk of, of defects and how to have a smarter baby. I'm not talking about hacking anything here. We're actually talking about just making sure that whatever is going to happen happens as good as it can. I'm about 210 pounds and lean. I'm relatively strong. I slept three hours last night, three hours the night before. In fact, I've slept less than five hours a night on average for the entire last two years. My son is two, by the way, in case there's a correlation. But that's not why, it's by design. And along, along the way, I eat a very special diet that I have on, on the website where I've basically removed toxins that slow down your brain function and things that make you fat. And part of that diet is I've been eating 4,500 calories a day and I haven't been exercising. I used to exercise more. I haven't exercised at all. You can see pictures of my six pack on my website. I'm not gonna lift up my shirt because that's just too dorky. But the bottom line is, is that when you understand your biochemistry and you control things in your biology, a lot of the things that we've been led to believe, a lot of the things that we're even looking at doing with quantified self around eat less and work out more. Yeah, if you wanna break your thyroid, go ahead. But that's actually not how the human body really works. And if you experiment with yourself and you get the data, you'll find that you don't work that way either. I eat more and I lose weight. When I ate 1,800 calories a day for a year and I worked out six times a week for an hour and a half a day, I weighed 300 pounds. Interesting. I've hacked my IQ in lots of different ways. Um, I fixed my vision by, in three months, I actually went from 2050 in one eye back to 2020, just doing exercises for an hour a week. 
Uh, I did some very interesting things by quantifying my hearing and finding out that there are spectral gaps in what I hear and then playing music back that has those, spec those spectral gaps missing to make your brain more sensitive to certain frequencies. And I share an awful lot of this data. My blood tests in various flavors and comments about them are online. Um, by the way, this, the diet that I eat for my brain includes, I eat about a standard sized stick of butter a day, about 100 grams of butter. Uh, and a lot more coconut oil, and a, a pound or two of grass-fed red meat, like lamb and beef. And I really like salmon, so I'll eat some of that too, and eggs, I eat that too. Uh, so I put my blood lipids online. Of course, they're better than anyone you know, because my triglycerides are 47, which is shockingly low. And my HDL, the protective one, is 81 in the last test, which is shockingly high. So I put them up there, because I'm like, guys, <laughs> the, the things need to happen that all the scientists are predicting will happen or something's wrong with the model. And right now we have a lot of problems with the model. The people keep doing things that don't lead to results. I have stuff about chronic diseases that I had when I was young. I admit that I've slept less than five hours a night on purpose. There are less people who do that and just don't admit it. I talk about this meat and butter diet. I talk about running electrical current across my head, now on video. And this is a blog post that's about to come up uh, where I've done some mapping um, based on happiness and satisfaction and frequency of orgasm. That would be male orgasm. Um, now, there are privacy implications here, and this is where I'm really getting with all this. I'm hackable because I put this information out there. So I work at a big security company, but there's enough out there. Uh, between all the different social media channels I have, there's maybe 10,000 people. One of them might be bad. <laughs> I don't know which one. Uh, I know some people better than others, and I have lots of people who want to hear what I have to say about cloud computing, or security, or biohacking, or brain hacking, or pregnancy health. All of those are significant and real. Because there's so much info about me out there, you can easily craft a story that's going to let you send me an email that looks very legitimate and it can have a file attached. Because I work at a company that has really good antivirus software and because I also know about zero day threats, I actually am aware I would never open a file from someone I didn't know. Or if I did, I would do it in a, in a protected area on my machine. The problem is that this could be a file from someone I know and it could even contain a link. So if someone wants to target the information on my machine, they're probably going to be able to get it because I'm this involved and because I'm this open. Because you can craft a message that says, hey, Dave, I see you're into anti-aging, and I have this new anti-aging uh, nonprofit blah, 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 tying back to what I do there. And why don't you check this out? Maybe we could meet for coffee. Anyone in this room would open an email like that if it was targeted to what you do. And that's how you do what's called whaling on the internet. That's a targeted attack on someone. The more info available online about you, the more targeted you make the attack. I'm also a little worried about misinformed insurers. So do you think they would sell me life insurance if they knew how much butter I eat? No. However, even though my blood chemistry is better than the guy selling me the insurance, who doesn't eat as much butter as he should. So there's a case where we have dogma and we have data. And dogma beats data, especially when it comes to insurance companies. They'll tell you to do the stupid thing that doesn't work because, well, that's what the rules say. Employers are the same way. So. I don't think at this point, because I'm relatively high profile, that I'm going to have a hard time with that. But if I was not high profile and I posted this data up there, and you Facebooked me or Googled me, you might say, this guy's just too weird. Like, why, why should we do this? And then there's parenting concerns. I guarantee you there's an angry vegan listening to this video right now. You. And you're saying, this guy feeds his kids butter, and he lets them eat red meat more than once a week? Oh my god. I'm like, yeah, and my kids can kick your kid's butt. Sorry. They're little caveman kids. But the serious thing there is that there are different belief systems here. And when you put your data online like that, if the people with another belief system, I don't mean science necessarily, I mean a belief system about nutrition or about what's appropriate for raising kids, they can call Child Protective Services and they can make your life really uncomfortable. Um, I don't think anyone's going to do that to me. And if they do, they won't like what happens. And there are social implications. Uh, I mentioned I blogging on. Uh, basically happiness and dopamine sensitivity in the brain as it relates to orgasm. Well, some people don't like that. I live in a small town. My kids go to a Waldorf school. Um, so maybe someone there will see it, but I'm hoping because it's a Waldorf school that none of them have web browsers, and, and that's OK. I didn't mention, by the way, my wife is Swedish. Uh, and so I can say, yet de bra. 
And what I worry about most in all this is enabling malevolence. And what I mean there is I mentioned this um, cerebroelectrical stimulation thing I have now. It's not an online device. There's no Bluetooth radio. It doesn't have an IP address. It has a little thumb wheel, and it has a keypad I can type things in. But there's no reason it couldn't be controlled by my iPhone, or couldn't be controlled from the cloud, even. And that creates a pretty scary scenario, because what we're dealing with here is not the typical, oh, someone might know, you know what my heart rate did. Um, actually, no, in this case, someone can change the state of my mind. You want to make me feel really tired? You dial this thing down to a nice so oh, six hertz or something, a nice sort of theta state, and you leave it on for five minutes or so. And I'm not going to be quite as awake as I am right now. I'm not going to probably pass out, but I'm going to be much less capable than I am right now. Um, this device was actually developed in the 50s by the Russians to put on the astronauts so the astronauts could develop less sleep, but it could be misused. Now, if it was controlled from my cell phone, I, I'm just imagining the day where your cell phone carrier doesn't like that you tethered your phone too much, used too much data, so they just put you in a theta state and then you go to sleep. I don't think they would actually do that. I would like to hope not. But the technology's there, and it's there today. And this is one of the softer technologies that I have for controlling the brain. There are feedback ones where you learn to control your own brain, and there are entrainment ones where other things control your brain. And we need to be really cautious with technologies like this, because if you hand controls of those up to some internet entity, uh, you might not like what happens. Um, likewise, I was CTO of uh, one of the quantified self-style startups with a heart rate monitoring thing. And we built social gaming metrics into this uh, to help people with their health. And it was always a, a question for me in the back of my mind. Well, on one hand, we're telling people, measure how many calories you burn. But all the data that I have on this other hand says, well, maybe it's the quality of the calories, not the quantity of the calories that's, that's terribly important. What if the things that your social media um, health data type of things, what if the things that are motivating you to do are the wrong things? That's a big question, and I know for many of the devices out there right now that if you do everything right and you get the very high score, you probably won't look like this. You might look more like that. So there are other, other things you can do with the data that are malevolent as well, including sorting information, identifying specific people. We have a very long history of this ever since technology came out, even before computers really were possible. Um, quick question, how many of you have heard of IBM's involvement with Germany in the 1940s? Is this, this is a kind of, I don't know the, how it is here in, in Sweden. Um, but uh, for the rest of the people who didn't raise their hands, some of the first and most sophisticated punch card machines that IBM made were used by the Nazis um, to, to help them sort people into one category or another. And uh, that's nothing compared to what credit bureaus do today. But still, we have... Uh, we have risks there, and the more of your data you put online, especially when all of us are putting our heart rate data online, it makes it really easy to legislate really bizarre things. One example, if all of your brainwaves were online, I could do an average and I could say, you know what, these people who are this far out of norm, they need to be on psychiatric medication because they're clearly deviating, right? So let's do it. Now, that's kind of nice. Okay, maybe those are people who are really sick, but maybe those are just Einstein. I'm pretty sure he was deviant. So we need to be hyper aware that when we put this information out there that we take care to look at ownership rights. And right now the Facebook model, which is toss everything to Facebook, is a bit of a risk. What you want to do when you can with your personal data is you want to keep that data private and maybe even consider encrypting it if it's particularly personal or if you care a lot about your privacy. Uh, I expect with uh, Quantified Self, there are several startups involved there who are actually looking at the security of your health information. And I think that's terribly important in the coming five years. With that, uh, at the end of the day, if you want to change the world, you can focus all your attention on political maneuverings or something. But one of the biggest things you can do is you can hack yourself. And when you do that, it changes your perspective of the world. And it also changes your abilities to, to do as much or to do what you want to do when you're there. If I hadn't have hacked my brain, there's no way I could have started a family, written a book, and continued to grow my successful career and done all the other things that I've done uh, in the last couple of years. It's because I am able to sleep less. It's because, literally, I have changed the way my brain functions, and 
I can also look at a mountain of email or a huge amount of, of whatever and not do it. And it doesn't trigger the fight or flight response that it triggers on almost everyone who hasn't successfully trained themselves to control that response and to make sure that their brain and their heart are working together, which is another technique I've used. So with that, I think it's time. Thank you all. <laughs>